greetings to Bogor International Christian Fellowship. Uh, it's really good to see you, even though we can't be uh, there in person. Uh, actually, I am in Bogor, <laughs> but I am doing my self-isolation now because of the nasty virus that we all have known and have actually uh, going around. So uh, thank you. I really covet your prayers. Uh, as you can pray, if you can pray for me, for my uh, recovery, and also for my mom, uh, because she is uh, older uh, and she is actually uh, need a lot of prayer so she doesn't get infected, if God's willing. Uh, I, I, I was able to spend with her for a couple of days. And I'm, I really thank God actually for that time, even though it's only a couple of days. I wish that I can be there in person, but hey, this is the best that we can do uh, at the moment. So let's let's pray together before I explain to you from the word of God. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for such an amazing opportunity you've given to us to open up your word again and to hear from it explained. And we pray, Lord, uh, that you'll be with us that you will speak to us, that you will remind us of what you want us to do and what you want us to be thinking about. And we do pray, Lord, uh, for your presence to be real and to be uh, speaking actively to us at this hour. And we commit all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me just start uh, with a question. I believe that you have heard things on politics or economics in Indonesia where things go from hero to zero in a matter of days. Some of us probably still remember the last days of Indonesia's second president, Suharto. This was back in 1998. Crazy days one day. It happened so quickly. And that's the sort of things we see happening in the book of Daniel today. The two Babylonian kings go from hero to zero in a flash. And it just goes to show that no one actually can take their position for granted, no matter how powerful or secure, that God is the one who ultimately raises people up. And he is the one who ultimately brings people down. Whether it's Nebuchadnezzar or Belshazzar or maybe Suharto or Gaddafi or whoever today. Let's recap on chapter four today before we look at chapter five, because they are related. In chapter four, King Nebuchadnezzar was actually portrayed here uh, in basically this chapter is all about King Nebuchadnezzar and King Belshazzar in chapter five. So chapter four actually begins in an unusual way. And I believe that the topic is familiar but the style probably is a little bit different. King Nebuchadnezzar actually had a dream, but he's going to tell us about it himself. So look at verse one. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the people of nations of every language who live in the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the most high God performed for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. So you see here, first of all, that God actually has done something amazing that shows he is the king of every kingdom, that he endures while everyone uh, in history actually fates uh, this King Nebuchadnezzar actually acknowledge that God is the king. And then you see that Nebuchadnezzar goes on to tell us about the dream. He's got a feeling it's about him. So it really scares him silly. Once again, in verse six, the wise men are no use in explaining it. So Daniel gets the call. And if we jump down to verse 19, you see here that Daniel actually describes the dream and then explains it. He says to the king, it's actually not the good news for you. I wish it was about someone else, but unfortunately, it's about you. 
you see in verse 20, <coughs> sorry, that he saw a tree that was large and strong and that stretched up to the sky, so big the whole earth actually could see it, the Bible says. And it provided food and shelter for the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. And in verse 22, actually we know that it represents Nebuchadnezzar. And that's actually the good part. He's great and strong and people over the whole world are ruled and protected by him. The problem is he is starting to believe in his own publicity. And that's his great that he is strong because of his own ability rather than because God made him what he is. So in verse 23, a heavenly messenger actually came and announces that the tree is to be cut down and destroyed. And the stump is to be left on the ground and bound with iron and bronze. And you see here that Daniel explained uh, what it means in verse 24. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live like wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdom of men and it gives them to anyone he wishes. So you see here that God's decision is that the king will be cut down to size. He's too big. And he'll have some sort of mental breakdown. But once he learns his lesson, he acknowledge, he will acknowledge that God actually ruled, that God will restore him. And that's the dream and its meaning. But we are told the purpose of the dream in verse 27 actually is a warning. Change your attitude. Change your attitude. So Daniel actually told Nebuchadnezzar to show his changed attitude to God in the way he treated people with kindness and justice. We are not told how the king responds to Daniel's warning until 12 months later, actually, in verse 28. Perhaps he did change his ways and kept his pride actually in check for a while. But then his true proud nature just bubbled back out in verse 29. 12 months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? That's actually God's true, how God is true to his warning. There is no delay. There is no instant consequences. And, and you see here, um, you see here that it's, it's really interesting that in verse 31, you see here in verse 31 that the words, while it was still on his lips, when a voice came from heaven, this is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your authority has been taken away from you. You'll be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals, animals. And you will eat grass like cattle and so on and so forth. And immediately what had been said about King Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled, as verse 33 said. So he has some sort of breakdown. He lives like an animal, even looks like one. His hair grows, his hair, uh, I mean, grows like eagle's feather, his nails like bird claws. And this is actually quite ironic because the man thought that he was a god and is, is made like an animal so he could learn that he is only actually just a human and he stayed like that until god decided that it was time seven times could be weeks or maybe months or even years the point of seven is that this is actually god's timing that you know he would predict it and he would uh, uh, he would brought it about and he ends it actually in verse 34 when Nebuchadnezzar realized that his sanity was restored. And Nebuchadnezzar's response here was that it should have been in the first place. Rather than honoring himself, he honors God. 
That's why he uh, actually praises God in verse 34 and 35. You see that the, the attitude actually has been changed, especially in verse 30. In verse 30, when he said that, is this not the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence by my, my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? But in verse 37, he realized that everything that God does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. So that's the lesson actually from chapter 4. So we came to think about learning the lessons of Nebuchadnezzar. After all, that's what the chapter was written for. Back in verse 1, he writes to the peoples, to the nations, and the men of every language who live in the world. He writes to tell us how great God's signs are and how his kingdom never ends. He wants us to learn from his experience. I want to look at how well the lessons were learned by those close to Nebuchadnezzar and how well his own descendants learn from his mistakes. I think that's the reason we jump straight to King Belshazzar in chapter 5. It's another story about a king, about a message from God and about Daniel and how the king goes from hero to zero. You see, Belshazzar might be called Nebuchadnezzar's son, but he is learning. He is not learning any lessons from his dad. The very next sentence about Nebuchadnezzar's lesson, when he said that everything God does is right and those who walk in pride is able to humble you see here in chapter 5, verse 1, what a contrast. They had this party, and, <coughs> and you see that they drank wine, and they praised the gods of gold and the silver and of bronze and of iron and stone. The contrast is like black and white. He, he basically learned nothing from the fall of his father. And he's headed actually to the same for the same fate. Much worse, actually. So instead of ruling with uh, justice and with wisdom, instead of acknowledging God's power and glory, he is partying with his subjects. He decides uh, a good drinking game is to praise the Babylonian gods. And while they drink from the Jewish temple cups, you know, this is actually the very op opposite of acknowledging God. So a hand actually appears and writes some words on the place of uh, on the palace wall, a heavenly hand actually, uh, but just normal words. What do they mean? Once again, none of the wise men except Daniel are any use here. He is called actually to the palace again. But before Daniel provides the interpretation, he gives Belshazzar a lesson, a lesson that he should have learned actually from his father. Look at verse 18. O king, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. People everywhere actually feared him. And in verse 20, you can see that when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was disposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived like uh, with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over the kingdom of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. I can imagine a young Belshazzar impatiently squirming in his throne who cares about history. 
get to the point. So what Daniel does in verse 22, he explained, but you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had goblets from his temple brought to you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank from a wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and of gold, of bronze, iron, wood, stone, which cannot, uh, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hands your life and all your ways. Then he basically gets to the meaning of the words. Many means numbered. God actually is numbering his days. Tackle means weight. It means God weigh him up and he's come up short. And Paris actually means Persia, who is going to deliver the blow. And that chapter finishes very differently to chapter 4. You see in verse 13, chapter 5, that very night, king, uh, the very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius, the meeting took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So God here has raised up and God has brought low and set someone else up in Belshazzar's place, just like Daniel actually had described. And whether you are God's people back then with Babylon or Persia in charge or God's people today with dictators or presidents, or prime minister in charge. There is a comfort actually in this, that there is that confidence and hope in God because God is on the throne and he is the one actually who raised these rulers where they are to where they are. The, the just and the unjust are alike actually. He knows everything that they have done. He knows how long they got. And when he calls them to account, everything will be done with perfect justice. And practically, that means that we should pray actually for our leaders. We should obey and support and respect them as best as we are able under God, because they are God's agents. But it's not just a lesson for rulers here. Nebuchadnezzar wants everyone to learn a lesson from him. That we are not rulers of our kingdom or whoever kingdom it is. There is a sense in which we are rulers. I see in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar actually was told, the God of heaven was, has given you dominion and power and might and glory in your hands. He has placed mankind and beasts of the field, the birds of the air, everything, wherever they live. He has made you ruler over them all. So there is a sense in which that's the rule that has been given to every one of us, where God made human beings back in Genesis chapter 1. And here is what he said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and birds of the air and over every living creatures that move on the ground. So God actually gave humanity the responsibility to rule over creation with him ruling over us. And he made us his image bearers or his representatives, every one of us. And the big story of the Bible is actually about how humanity responded to that job. We, instead of recognizing God as our ruler and serving and ruling under him, we chose actually to rule ourselves. We chose to do it. We chose that this is actually our kingdom. We decided that we knew better than God. The, the same sin of pride that was Nebuchadnezzar's downfall, the same sin of pride that was Belshazzar's downfall, Adam and Eve actually chose it. And every human being since chooses it, chose it. And we all think that we know better than God. We all want our way than God's way. 
and we all think, um, you know, what we have and what we are, where we are is actually because of our own abilities. But the reality is that God is actually on the throne, not us. We need to repent. We need to return to God and recognize his right to rule over us. So you need to submit to him, submit in our attitudes, in our choices, in our words, in our thoughts, actions, everything. And then show that in the way that we actually treat the world that God created. Show that in living out justice and mercy. And that's actually the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar wants us to learn from him. But there is one final point that I want to make, and it's about good rulers. The reality is that no matter how good or bad a ruler is, there is another one who is on the throne and one who has been given authority and power, just like Nebuchadnezzar. One who, despite it all, not once, grabbed for more than what he was entitled to. Not once. That pride actually turned the right order of things upside down. One who always lived in submission. And God actually is on the throne. And, and there is one actually who comes with the cloud of heaven. You see in chapter 7, he is the son of man. And in verse 14, God actually gives him authority and power and sovereign power. All peoples and nations and men of every language worship him. His dominion actually is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is the one that will never be destroyed. And the thing is that Daniel only saw it in a vision. But we, as human beings who live after Jesus, we have experienced it. Jesus is the Son of Man. He is God's eternal love an only son, who was born as a human. He lived a perfect life of submission, love, and humility. And then he died a, a criminal's death in our place. And then God actually raised him to life and declared him Christ and King. And he is seated at God's right hand at the moment. And that's where he is now, seated and ruling over everything, ruling over China, over North Korea, over U.S., ruling over global financial crisis and environmental crisis, ruling our, over our presidents and governments, ruling over you and me. But for all that power and might, all that authority and right, there is none of the pride and injustice that goes with human rule. None of the rebellion and self-serving that we found in Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And he calls that the same attitude in the way we live our lives in serving him. And that's actually the lesson from Nebuchadnezzar. Listen to what Philippians chapter 2 challenges us to learn from those lessons. And I'll close with these words. Philippians starting in chapter 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition in or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grass, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. And we pray, Lord, that you reminded us how we need to put you as our king. Some of us have already made that decision 
maybe a few years ago or a few decades ago. And we realize, Lord, sometimes we often do not put that in practice. And we pray, Lord, that we may be able to put Jesus as our only ruler who has full authority over us. And we pray, Lord, that you help us as we do that in our lives. For those of us who never put our trust in Jesus at all, we I do pray, Lord, that you, you work in their hearts, that you change them, that you challenge them with this word, that you reminded them, Lord, that nothing in this world lasts apart from your control and apart from your will. Thank you so much, Lord. And we pray and give thanks to you again in Jesus' name. Amen.